This week on Phone a Friend, I saw Barbie and let Ma tell you all about it. Drake's in bed with a younger woman, and reality stars might be going on strike. But before they do, I'm phoning Selling Sunset's Brie Tiesi. We'll talk having a baby with Nick Cannon and why people can't get over it. It's unfortunate that my personal situation is so controversial to so many people and that they can't see past that. All that and so so much more. Barbie. Mostly just Barbie. I'll see you on the Malibu Beach. Girl, let's phone a friend with Jesse Kripschick. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Phone a Friend. I'm Jesse Crookshank, and I do not have a baby with Nick Cannon. <laughs> But my phone a friend, Brie Tiesi, does. We're going to get into that. But let me begin this episode with a sensual description of what I'm wearing. <clears throat> On the bottom, I'm wearing black skims as shorts because if you don't look too close, they could pass as a bike short. And as you know, I got them free. And on top, I'm wearing a sweatshirt that is official Kiki Palmer scandal merch. It says, I'm a mother, gifted to me by none other than Jason, my producer. How does it fit? Oh, hi, Jay. (laughs) Hi. It fits like a glove. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, it fits perfectly. It looks so cute. I mean, when you held it up, it looked five times too big. But okay. oh no! Well, then I should should I be worried that it's like a little bit? It's 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 a snug fit. It's a snug fit. No, that's great. Perfect. I'm so happy. So for my birthday, it was not enough for Jason to take me out to the Barbie movie on opening night to wine and dine me at the Cheesecake Factory first. He also got me Kiki Palmer Scandal merch a week after we discussed the scandal on this show. Ladies and gentlemen, find a man who will treat you like Jason, (laughs) my producer. Uh, Mm. We love Topical scandal merch. We love topical scandal merch. Support the industry. (laughs) What's the rule of this show? When life gives you lemons, make merch. Yeah. Because we'll support it. You need merch that says that. Right. Oh, you're right. Oh, my God. When is the phone of friend merch coming out? Somebody write that down. Phonies or whatever you are calling you, please write it down. We'll get merch going. I promise. Okay, so our first item of merch is going to say, when life gives you lemons, make merch. Got it. So, Jason, thank you. Thank you so much. And can we talk about the Barbie movie? Yes. Okay, we will try not to spoil it for our phone of friends. If, you know, you were one of the 14 people who did not see it. Mm -hmm. But we have to discuss because I have never experienced anything like it. I feel confident saying that. So we arrived at the mall on a Friday night and Everywhere you looked, it was groups of girls in pink mini dresses, pink sequins, pink tutus. I saw men in pink cowboy hats, men in pink mini dresses. There was a woman walking a pink dog that people were like posing with in the mall. The Cheesecake Factory was lit pink in celebration of the Barbie movie. And listen... When the Cheesecake Factory changes its decor for the first time since (laughs) 1992 for a movie, you know it's going to be big. So I wore a pink, like a pink t-shirt and a little pink cardigan. And at first when I got there, I was like a little embarrassed. And then I looked around and I realized that wearing pink was like showing up to a sports game in the uniform of the home team. Like this was an event. Jason, by the way, uh, You showed up in black. All black. (laughs) All black. Honestly looked like a villain. Looked like a villain. I'm shocked they let you in. I looked like I was going to see Oppenheimer. Absolutely. They were like, wait, sorry, sir, your depressing four-hour movie is that way. Oh, no? You're with her? Okay. But honestly, do you remember going to a movie that felt that eventized in the same way that this did? No. I'm trying to think of, like, the last big event style movie like that where I saw people dress up and I can't think of it. The last time I had like a festive opening night experience at a movie was when I saw Stomp the Yard 
starring Chris Brown and Columbus Short, who have both since been canceled. That's how long it has been oh my God. since I went to like a major, it felt like it was a major event watching a movie. And looking around that theater, I was like, there is no way this movie can live up to this level of hype and anticipation. And yet somehow it did. It did. I loved it. Can we can we say that? Like, we loved it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We loved it. I, I will say the first 20 minutes I was nervous because I literally had seen every scene and I thought, oh, my God, have I seen this entire movie in promotional clips? But then when it really sort of dove into the plot, I don't know. It was just so unexpected, so fun, and yet surprisingly subversive for a major studio blockbuster. And, like, yes, the plot isn't perfect, the script really asks you to, like, suspend some disbelief. But let me tell you this. Margot Robbie is so stunning to look at. Ryan Gosling steals every scene yeah. he is in. I mean, please. He is giving breaker high Ryan Gosling, and I could not get enough. And also, the shit that they got away with in this giant, big, major studio movie was staggering to me. Don't you think? Yeah, like you mean like the Mattel stuff? Yeah, like making fun of Mattel, poking right. fun at themselves, the referential stuff, the breaking of the fourth wall. Like I just yeah. did, didn't expect that there would be so much like Greta Gerwiginess in this giant Warner Brothers movie. Yeah. It was such a pleasant surprise. And now, I, I, normally I, I play my phone of friends messages at the end of each episode, but I did get a message about the Barbie movie. So you know what, Jace? It's my show. It's your show, girl. Let's check my voicemail. Check, check, check your voicemail. Hi, Jesse. It's Andrea from Mississauga. I just wanted to tell you I love everything that you do. I really have appreciate how much you just embrace your target audience and really lean in. And I think you're so funny and relatable because of it. I think something that shares the same target audience as you is the Barbie movie. I was surprised like just how hard hitting it was as a, you know, elder millennial mom. I can't believe how much I cried. I cried uh, when America Ferreira made her speech, I cried at the end. I cried in the car on the way home. I cried after I got home. It was almost like I was pregnant. I didn't know what was happening. Um, but I just felt as uh, this, you know, feminist mom trying to do it all and hold it all together that I felt so seen by that movie. And I was so, I don't know, proud of Greta Gerwig for putting it out there. Um, and I'm so excited to hear what you thought of it and what your take on it was. I think you're going to touch on it hopefully this Thursday, and I really can't wait to listen. Thanks so much. Bye. Oh, Andrea, I really love that. Thank you for leaving that message. I, I, I didn't cry. I almost cried just listening to that voicemail. I didn't cry during the movie, but... You know, I was weighted down by a belly full of lettuce wraps from the Cheesecake Factory, so I, <laughs> I wasn't as unstable as I usually am. But I did feel that too, Andrea from Mississauga. America Ferreira, first of all, who knew that she was so beautiful? Like, clearly there were not enough close-ups of her poreless flawless skin in the sisterhood of the traveling pants. I had no idea. So she gives a speech about the weight of expectations that women and mothers carry. And I just, I feel like the messaging is something that we've all heard from like mom influencers on Instagram, but it did hit different when delivered in a giant summer blockbuster. Like it's different hearing that message while watching a cat and nat video on the toilet versus in a <laughs> packed theater. You know, I, I really did at that point feel like turning around like, yeah, all you childless millennials in your pink. You hear that motherhood is hard. Being a woman is hard. Balancing it all is fucking hard. I felt I felt the need to do that. And I do feel like, ironically, because the movie is about a, a world run by women, I feel confident in saying that I think the movie is good, Jason, because a woman directed it. Because women aren't often given these huge opportunities. And when we are in any line of work, in any context, we nail it because we have to. 
Because there's no other choice. Because if you fail as a woman, you don't get a second chance. If you fail as a man, you get a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth chance. Mm -hmm. Greta Gerwig was given the chance to direct this summer blockbuster with this huge IP attached. And, like, she knocked it out of the park. And after the movie, made a staggering $377 million dollars. She made history. Barbie is the biggest debut for any movie directed by a woman. And, you know, hopefully that means we're going to get more big movies directed by women. And you better believe every Mattel toy will be made into a major motion picture, okay? <laughs> Brace yourselves oh, yeah. for, like, Polly Pocket starring Elle Fanning coming to a theater near you. <laughs> Which I would definitely see. I mean, please, we're seeing that. And I'll also say that I'm not surprised Barbie made so much money. If a movie can drag me, a tired elder millennial mother of three out at 9.30 p.m. on a Friday yeah. night in festive attire, then really it's bound to break records. Also, you know my elder millennial is showing because I have been playing Matchbox 20 nonstop since seeing that movie. Okay? Did you do this, Jason? Like, the minute I got into my car after we left each other, I started playing, like, I started with, I wanna push you around, well, I will, well, I... And then I, like, rotated down to, it's 3 a.m., I must be lonely, must be lonely. I went for Dua Lipa. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. And that's why you're a gay man and I'm a straight man, right. clearly. Because that, uh, the Matchbox 20 as like a, the peak of straight male music just really hit for me. Well, I'm not crazy. I'm just a little <laughs> unwell. I know right now you can tell. <laughs> Did you know that Matchbox 20 was my first concert, Jason? No. Well, Good in one. fairness, no, Paula Abdul was my first concert. Um, oh, even better. Uh, oh, yes, like with the dancing cat. But Matchbox 20 was the my first concert I was allowed to go to without parent supervision. Oh, okay. My sister was tasked with bringing me and my little friend Ashley. We were 14. She was 16. What we did not know, nor did my parents, is that my sister was secretly meeting a boy at the Matchbox 20 concert. So she abandoned us immediately. And we were just like 14 with like bowl cuts and unibrows alone and honestly thriving in the yeah. mosh pit at Matchbox 20. <laughs> I wanna push you up. So thank you. Thank you, Barbie movie, for making us all feel seen. You know, really did. And because it's been a week of Barbie, let's keep talking Barbie. It's been a week. It's been a week. Yeah. I forgot about all that whole Matchbox 20. Oh my God. I moment. haven't stopped listening. I haven't stopped listening. The Ryan Gosling version is, is not on the soundtrack, but I've also been bumping the soundtrack nonstop. That Dua Lipa yeah. song. Ooh, so good. Yeah. Okay. So the Barbie hype was real before the movie premiered, but now that the movie is out, the hype really is only getting stronger. Like, everyone has an opinion, a recap, a secret from the set they want to spill. And since I've gone from, you know, like, slightly cynical to fully indoctrinated by Barbie in less than a week, <laughs> I want you, my phone of friends, to be too. So I put together a list of the biggest Barbie headlines that have dropped since the movie came out for a segment called Let Me Tell You Something About Barbie. Let me tell you something about Barbie. Is that the greatest segment title in the history of this podcast, Jason? I think it is. It's, I'm really happy with it. I, I feel... It's so funny. <laughs> I feel really, I feel, we feel really good about good it, job. everyone. Thank you so much. Let's begin. So you all know that before Greta and Margot took the project, Amy Schumer was originally attached to play Barbie. This was in 2016, but she dropped out because of creative differences with the studio at the time, which was Sony. So it's now come out that one of said differences was that Schumer's Barbie was supposed to be an inventor, but Sony wanted inventor Barbie to invent a jello high heel, and they wouldn't budge on it, and Amy wasn't happy. She said the final straw was when Sony sent her a pair of Manolo Blahniks to celebrate her casting announcement. Amy says she was upset because the message behind getting a gift like that is like, well, every woman should want shoes and clothes. So she shoomered her way out of the contract, and that Barbie movie was never made. I didn't know that. Fact. 
And I would just like to go on record to say that I am a capital F feminist, but I was fine when you gifted me with a Kiki Palmer sweater, Jason. Okay, good. Okay. Also, if you'd like to send over a pair of $1,200 Manolos to celebrate my live show at Just for Last next week, I would accept them. Okay. <laughs> Plug. Okay. Plug. Plug and noted. Amy posted on Instagram this week that she's seen the Barbie movie and, quote, really enjoyed it. And I don't believe she was wearing Manolo Blahniks at the time. Let me tell you another story that came out this week. So the movie's casting director has done an interview and revealed who else said no to being in the Barbie movie. Can you imagine saying no to being in what has become a record-breaking blockbuster? So there are many Kens that appear in the movie, and apparently the following people turned down the opportunity to play sidekick Kens. They are Bowen Yang from SNL, love him, Ben Platt from, what was that musical? Evan Hansen. From Dear Evan Dear, Hansen, the yeah. musical. Thank you, Broadway star. <laughs> and my friend, our friend, Dan Levy. I can only imagine how he's feeling right now. <laughs> Did you get it? Oh, yeah. I can only imagine. I said, I can. I can right. only imagine. I can. You know, the best jokes are the ones you have to explain. Just for anyone who wants to get into comedy and perform live at JFL, just like me, just th- those, are the, those are the heavy hitters. <laughs> what do you have to explain to one of your closest <laughs> friends? <laughs> Let Mattel you one more hilarious headline. Apparently, Barbie helped add $5 million to Oppenheimer's sales this past weekend. So it was estimated that 6% of people who saw Oppenheimer said they only did because the Barbie movie was sold out. So they settled on Oppenheimer as a result. Imagine going for dance routines and sparkles (laughs) and settling on atomic bombs and communism. (laughs) And no shade to Oppenheimer. It is supposed to be incredible. I know many people who went to see it on opening night and they're still in the theater. (laughs) It's that long. Is it supposed to be good? Yeah, I don't know. Your partner saw it. What did he say? I did. I just got upset that he chose that over Barbie and we didn't talk any further of it. <laughs> you know, Evan also chose Oppenheimer over Barbie and I like couldn't understand why. But you know what, Jason? I think this is good. I think it's good for us. I think we have found partners that are the yang to our yin. Yeah. You know what I mean? The brown to our pink. And the final thing I want to tell you is that, sadly, you can't have a smart, thoughtful, woke storyline without bigoted people finding something wrong with it. Here is a compilation of thoughts and opinions about Barbie from pastors, right-wing politicians, Fox News anchors, and our friend, Piers Morgan. And I curse in the name of the Lord this new Barbie movie. This is an assault on not just Ken, but all men. This movie is the slickest, most insidious packaging of feminist cliches and trans grooming that you have ever seen. I mean, it's nothing sacred. They just gave Barbie the Bud Light treatment, which probably looks pretty stupid in retrospect. And they're trying to kiss up to the Chinese Communist Party because they want to make money selling the movie in China. This is really just another indoctrination vehicle. Why won't they let our little girls have anything? I'll tell you what they did let our little (laughs) girls have. $377 million on opening weekend, smashing box office records and opening doors for millions of little girls who can now add blockbuster filmmaker to their list of aspirations. Thank you. And honestly, I can't wait to groom my kids. I'm sorry, show my kids (laughs) this movie. I think it would go way over their heads for at least another few years, but I've already shown them the I'm Just Ken video on repeat because I like have this thing where I try to normalize men singing and dancing for my boys. I think that's important. Also, I just wanted to watch Ryan Gosling on a Saturday afternoon. So I'll let Rio close out this segment. Rio? I'll show you on the Malibu Beach. Thanks for letting Mattel you something about Barbie. Let Mattel you something about Barbie. What's next? What's next? In the hierarchy of marketing geniuses, it goes the Barbie movie PR team, followed closely by Drake. 
Okay, Drake of going out to dinner with a girl in gladiator flats and a wrap sweater fame. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Her. So Drake has a book of poetry and an album coming out. So does he make the rounds to the big entertainment shows to promote it? No. He invites an up and coming TikToker that most people haven't heard of to interview him in his bed. Okay, her name is Bobby Altoff. She's a young, deadpan, sort of like her whole shtick is she's just this awkward, kind of funny comedian. She has less than a million followers. She's only interviewed a handful of other people, but Drake saw potential for a viral moment, invited her to his house, and viral moments ensued. This video has been watched and shared millions of times, and in a matter of days, suddenly, everybody is talking about Drake and his book and his album and... His birth name. Listen to this. Your name is Aubrey. Yeah. So don't. But like, there's nothing. Okay. Yeah. But my mom named me Aubrey, a guy's name. That's Aubrey's not a guy's name. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it Have is. Have you ever met a male Aubrey? Yeah, you're looking at him. You what? don't even go by that because it's such a bad name. No, that's not true. It's just like. Why do you go by Drake? Because it's shorter. You know, t- people with two syllables are way less successful than people with one. Sorry. I mean, I do think it's important to remind ourselves that his first name is Aubrey. Yeah. Okay? Because I don't know about you, but when I think of an Aubrey, I do think of a girl with gladiator flats and a wrap sweater. That's that's Aubrey to me. I also Googled, are people with two syllables less successful than people with one? Because if so, sorry to my son Rio, because Dre will be way more successful. But when I Googled it, the only thing that came up was this interview. So clearly this is a Drake <laughs> fact, not a scientific fact. Next, they talked about dating. <laughs> if you could hook me up with anyone, who would it be? It doesn't have to be someone famous. It could be like... It yeah, could be, it does. Uh, why? You're not going to marry someone that's not famous, Of course. I, w- I, I probably will end up marrying somebody that's not famous. Famous people really aren't that... Like, aren't that anything? They're not that intriguing. They're not You're not that, that anything? Huh? Aren't, you're not that anything or that intriguing? No, I'm an anomaly. Did you have trouble saying that word? <laughs> I don't know why I did. Try it again. I'm an anomaly. Good job. So first of all, she's so cute and funny. She deserves all the success to come out of this interview. Also, I believe that he's not going to marry someone famous because deep down, Drake is Aubrey. He's just like a nerd with swag who probably will end up marrying that girl in the Gap rap sweater, you know? Finally, here's what he said about marriage. Why haven't I gotten married? Yeah. The truth? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I can offer somebody what they'd be looking for right Why? now. It, just consistency. I think my life, just... my work is my priority. Mm-hmm. So then I... I don't I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to not be able to sleep around. <laughs> well, no, I don't want to get married cuz like I just don't want to disappoint someone and like I'm not like Amish. Listen. <laughs> Amish or not, I want to marry Drake after this interview. I'm sorry. I'm not proud of it. But he is like, I truly believe that he is a savant of the internet. Drake knows what's going to pop off online. He allows himself to be skewered. He doesn't take himself too seriously. He like leans into the awkwardness. And in doing so, he gives the people what they want. You know? And I believe I did say this early on this podcast, like early days, the real phonies know. I said Drake is one of the sexiest men I have ever been in the physical presence of. And I only like him more after this strange viral interview. Plus, I now know that he has a book of poetry out now. But please, let's be real. This man has already written poetry, like last name ever, first name greatest. I'm on a roll like Cottonelle. And... You only live once, that's the motto, YOLO. You only live once, that's the motto, YOLO. He invented YOLO. This man is a poet. He is the Walt Whitman of our time. Now it's just official with the book. Or to put it more poetically, call him the referee because he be so official. Should I keep saying Drake lyrics like a very white woman or should we move on? Is there no record of YOLO prior to that? No, he is the, wow. the inventor. 
I didn't know that until this very moment. Oh, Jason, I'm so glad that I was the one to tell you about this because you know what? <laughs> yeah. YOLO. You only live once. That's the motto to get YOLO. Thanks, Aubrey. What's next? What's next? Okay, if you got all hot and bothered by Drake in a bed, get ready for Jeff Bezos on a yacht. It's time for hot couples doing hot things. Mm, hot couples, there's so much hot, 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 hotter than us. And yes, I am so sorry to disappoint you, but today's hot couple is billionaire Jeff Bezos and his alive girl, Lauren Sanchez, because somehow I have never discussed them on this podcast, and yet I am obsessed with them. Did you know that, Jason? No, we never talked about this. Love them. Okay, so if you don't have a Google search history that says Jeff Bezos, Lauren Sanchez, yacht pics like I do, let me fill you in. Do you know a lot about this couple, Jace? No, well, uh, no, I don't. Buckle up in your yacht. So their relationship started as an extramarital affair, as all great romances do. So in 2019, you remember this, right? They were caught when their private text messages were leaked, which included Jeff Bezos' nude pics and his now iconic text message to her that said, I love you alive, girl. I don't know this either. Jason! What? (gasps) I am educating you. Like Like there's actual nude photos of him? Yes, yes. Oh, and it was like a whole security breach, like, because he's Amazon. How did this possibly happen? Yes. Uh-huh. Wow. And also, like, is there anything sexier than being called alive? Right. <laughs> you know? Apparently alive, not. Girl. Because they both left their respective spouses and other parents of their four and two children to be with each other. And they have been living their breast Sorry, I was looking at a picture of her best lives since, okay? Let me tell you who's living their life with YOLO front and center. Lauren and Jeff. So they got engaged, bought a $175 million house together and a $500 million super yacht, which has a custom wood sculpture of Lauren Sanchez on the prow. And when I saw this a few months ago, like, this is when I went all in on this couple, okay? Have you seen this picture? I'm sending it to you right now. Oh, yes, the yacht one I've seen, yes. It is amazing. It is a massive sculpture of her, I mean, made to look like Lauren Sanchez hanging off the ship with, like, flowing hair and just an absolutely (laughs) heaving bosom. And I'm just going to say it, like, rock hard nipples? Like, what is happening? And it's so big. Those nipples have to be the size of, like, garbage cans, okay? It's just hanging off this $500 million yacht. It's like a 3D softcore pornographic rendering of his new lady. And I just, I can't sleep at night. I think about this often. I want to know, what was the conversation? Like, did she suggest he commission a sculpture of her for the yacht? Did he surprise her <laughs> with an unveiling? Our million-dollar large-breasted bespoke sculptures, his love language. What is happening? And like when they invite friends on the boat, do the friends have to like take it seriously and be like, wow, what a beautiful piece of art. Right. Or like, do they laugh behind their back like we are right now? Oh my God, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. No, you're so right. Like Chris Jenner has to board that yacht and be like, Lauren, you've never looked more radiant. <gasps> Look at those nips glistening in the Mallorca sun. Yeah, you have to take it totally seriously because I think they do. I think everything they do, they take completely seriously. Like this past weekend. Lauren Sanchez posted a thirst trap, no irony, completely serious, of Jeff Bezos. Yes, Jeff Bezos, who has like a wonky eye and a bald head. And I can say that because he treats his employees like trash and could single-handedly lower the poverty rate on Earth. And yet he chooses to spend billions on going to space and putting sculptures on yachts. Not the most beloved guy, but I digress. In the pig. He is shirtless, emerging from the ocean onto said yacht. His bald head is like glimmering in the sun like the top of a circumcised penis. 
<laughs> and Lauren Sanchez's caption says, is it just me or is it hot outside? Sun emoji, heart emoji. I'm sorry. I don't know why I find it so funny. And the reaction has really been split online. So Chris Jenner, for example, let it, left a series of flame emojis because you know she'd trade Corey Gamble in a heartbeat, while Piers Morgan left a series of crying, laughing emojis, making this the first thing I have in common with Piers Morgan, okay? I'm not proud of it, but it's hilarious to me because I know Jeff Bezos is, like, ripped, but he's also like a 59-year-old supervillain. There is no world where I look at him and call any thirsty moms. Are you trapped by this thirst trap, Jason? He looks good in the picture. Sure. He's definitely got a chef and a trainer. So, like, sure. <laughs> the angle is working. Let it be known that this thirst trap worked on Jason. <laughs> the thing that I find fascinating about this couple, Jay, is, like, he did what all assholes do. He started as a nerd, built a tech company with an intelligent, supportive woman by his side, mm -hmm. got rich, suddenly got the attention of this, like, hot, like, auga entertainment reporter, left his wife. And now it's like we're just sitting back and watching the midlife crisis together. Like, everything they do seems like it happened before or after they had sex. They just seem so horny for each other. Like, she can't believe he's with her. He can't believe she's with him. And they want everyone to know it. And now we know that Jason is horny for Jeff Bezos. And this has Fine. been Hot Couples Doing Hot Things. Mm, hot couples, there's so much hot, 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 hotter than us. I don't hate the picture. <laughs> What's next? What's next? While Jeff Bezos is yachting, shirtless and glistening, everyone else is striking. Actors aren't working. Writers aren't working. And since The White Lotus Season 3 isn't coming anytime soon, that means we're going to be relying heavily on reality TV. I mean, how else will I fill my evenings if not watching rich ladies flip tables, Kardashians shut down DMVs, and golden bachelors finding love, you know? Well, OG Real Housewife Bethany Frankel agrees. She thinks, like actors, <laughs> reality TV stars are being exploited. But instead of hitting the picket lines, she's hitting TikTok. Because where else? To call for a reality TV talent union. Which... I gotta say, like, I sort of laughed at at first, but hear her out. So she says, reality stars have always been treated like, you know, second-class citizens in Hollywood, and it's time that they're not just treated fairly, but compensated fairly. The hot topic is residuals. So Bethany says that while she was only paid, and this is hard to believe, $7,250 total for her first season of reality TV, people are still binge-watching those episodes, and she isn't seeing any extra money for it. Listen to this. So I myself have generated millions and millions of dollars in advertising and online impressions being on reality TV and have never made a single residual. So either I'm missing something or we're getting screwed too. People on the hills and the bachelor and bachelorette get paid peanuts to do what they do and people can still watch those episodes from years gone by. I love her like taking pity on the hills cast members. <laughs> that was my favorite part. I know. <laughs> I know. Of all the shows she could take pity on, she went for the hills. Yeah, we're right there with you. I mean, we spoke about residuals with Amanda last week. So the problem is that while, you know, let's say the Friends actors are getting paid every time their episode re-airs on network television, anyone with a show on a streaming service isn't, and neither are reality stars, right? We are all re-watching Laguna Beach and the hills, but... Lauren and Kristen aren't making a right. dime from yeah. that. They are making whatever they negotiated in high school, right? Or as like 21-year-olds in 2006. The streamers are making money. The networks are. But Brody Jenner has to pay for his Soho House Malibu membership on his own, okay? He's not seeing any cash from the reruns. This is how I feel. And it might be controversial, but to me, like, yes, residuals would be amazing. But 
What you get as a smart reality star is a platform to make money other ways, right? Lauren still has a Kohl's line. Whitney is a hugely <laughs> successful influencer. Kristen has Uncommon James. Brody Jenner is a world-renowned DJ, I think. In part, because episodes of The Hills and Laguna Beach are still available to stream, right? They are making way more money by using their visibility from the reality show to do other things. I will say Jen Bunny and Dieter Schmitz, you're on your own. I'm sure that they would appreciate the residuals. But also, when you enter into an agreement, sorry, like, that's the contract. You know, like, you're told that you're not going to be seeing any money from the network in the future. I never made residuals. I think people still watch episodes of the after show or, like, the goods. I don't make money from that, but but that's okay because I agreed to a contract and, you know, you sign up knowing what you're stepping into. And that really is what Bethany is trying to change with a union because reality stars are just being themselves, right? They're actually getting drunk at Les Deux or getting punched in a Jersey Shore bar. So protection for them is even more important. Listen to this. We are not actors. We are not playing other people. We are not saying the words that are written for us. We are exposing ourselves, our families, our lives, our children. Look at Raquel having an affair. Her life is pretty much ruined. And at what price? Well, side note, apparently while the rest of the Vanderpump Rules cast is back to filming, she's still renegotiating her contract. So make those millions, Raquel. Should we put that on a sweater? Make those millions, Raquel? That's a good one. That could work. I don't know. How do you feel, Jay? Yeah, like you said, it's just, that's what you sign up for. You go into the agreement knowing that you're not going to get residuals. So, like, why complain about it 20 years later? Right. I mean, I think it's like, it's like this is the movement. It's all happening. You know, we're seeing people who are coming out of the woodwork on our feeds talking about exploitation they felt in the past. Like, as any movement does, it really is sparking conversations, I think, across all industries. And I and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I just think reality stars are given a platform with their shows. And if possible, they can turn that attention into multi-million dollar businesses. You know, they can turn scandals into merch. I'm wearing it now. <laughs> and of course, unions can have Help protect people and sloppy bartenders, aspiring fashion designers, and wealthy housewives deserve protection too. So good luck with the union, Bethany. And can I just make a suggestion that if you do form a union for reality stars, may you call it the reunion. Thank you. Oh, and Andy Cohen is absolutely the president. What's next? What's next? Okay, so if reality stars do form a union, Brie Tiesi should be VP, okay? It's like Andy Cohen, Brie Tiesi. She started on the reality show Wags. She was briefly married to NFL quarterback Johnny Manziel. She then met Nick Cannon. She was on his show Wild and Out. They had a baby together a year ago. It's her first child, his eighth child. And almost immediately after birthing legendary Love Cannon, that is his name, she made her debut on Selling Sunset. And what a debut. Okay, she like blew up. Up. I loved her right out of the gate. She just like came in and gave no fucks. She got a million followers overnight. She sparked a million controversies around her decision to have a baby with Nick Cannon. And as you can imagine, I have questions. And when I have questions, I get to phone a friend. Girl, let's phone a friend. I am phoning badass business badge, Brie Tiesi, to talk about her starting a family with Nick Cannon, although I don't want that to be the focal point. We're going to talk Selling Sunset, what plastic surgery procedures she's had, which ones she regrets, who named her baby legendary, why she wants him to be a one-year-old influencer, does she listen to her partner, Nick Cannon's other baby mama, Mariah Carey, and so much more. Hello? Hello? Is this Brie? It is. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, Brie. I am so excited to call you. Thank you for answering. Yes, of course. Hi. I became absolutely obsessed with you on Selling Sunset. I have so much I want to talk to you about. But first things first, on Selling Sunset, you are always a feast for the eyes. I mean, you're giving shoulder, you're giving cutouts. So I'd like to give people a feast for the ears. Please describe what you're currently wearing <laughs> and feel free to go into detail. Um, not much, unfortunately. <laughs> I am currently 
I am currently wearing my actual pajama slip that looked really cute as a top, but it's actually Stop. my slip sweater, and I have a matching robe that I took off because I was like, that might be a little much. And I'm literally bundled up in a blanket, still in my pajamas because I'm hiding from my child and his friend downstairs while I, I'm up here. <laughs> um, Brie, I mean, this might be... The earliest air horn sound effect I've ever given out in the history of Phone a Friend. The fact that you're hiding from your child to do this inf- yes. interview, while I am also hiding from my three childs to do this interview. Oh. I mean, we're basically the same. Yes. Oh my, three? Girl, I don't know how you do it. I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I do I, When I got dressed yeah. for you, just I was in pajamas seven minutes ago. I got dressed for yeah. you and I was like, what's the most Brie outfit I have? So I'm wearing so like this cute. pinstripes situation but as you can see yes. postpartum the pants don't fit i could not get them up on my like weird wrinkly <laughs> post baby tummy yeah right? i gave up on all of it i was like forget it just give me like a bigger size or like a more masculine like baggy fit and we'll call it a day yeah it's fine it's a power look it's a power look it that is. you bring to the exactly. show okay i want to get to know brie inside the silky pajama and the power suits. But first, I want to start with Selling Sunset. You joined season six. You're one of the new girls, along with Nicole, who I had on this podcast. Mm -hmm. How did you get approached to be on the show? Um, I was approached, I don't know which season. I I always say this. I want to say it was season two or three or something along those lines. I was like, approach. yeah, it was before COVID um, and all of that. Most people know that I recently came out with my partner, but I was really private about my situation. So I wasn't really ready to be in the spotlight any more than I already was. I really, you know, kind of took a step back after being married to somebody that was in it. And I really just, it it just didn't sit well with me. It wasn't really something I wanted to do at that time. And then once my life was already public I was like well fuck it here we go we're already here (laughs) so at that point it's like you just gotta embrace it this is who I am it is what it is obviously I you know I think people say a lot like you chose this you put yourself here like yeah kind of um there's certain things that I kept really private for a very long time so Mm. now I'm in a different space and I've also grown a lot I've been in the industry for over a decade so it's a little bit different um I don't think I could have handled the pressure and the scrutiny and all of those things you know four years ago um I was just in a different place than I am now so so you just embraced the fuck it mentality and you were like, okay. Yep. And this was not the first reality show you'd been asked to be on, right? No, I've been asked on a million. <laughs> I've been asked on every dating show known to man. I've been, I was on WAGS and I actually was signed to do another season of WAGS and then they got canceled. <gasps> um, I've had kind of been full circle. It's kind of happened a few times and it's always been something where I was like, Ugh, I don't know, but I did love that this was business oriented and it for the most part, (laughs) it was geared more towards that. Yeah. So I did like that and I ended up accepting. Yeah. And I'm so glad you did (laughs) because you really do bring something different and special to the show. You say yes and you start filming six weeks after giving birth to your son, legendary Love Cannon. I'm watching you strut down Sunset Boulevard in lubes, a tweed miniskirt, and a bustier. (laughs) Like, this woman is a goddamn superhero. Like, could you be honest with me? Were you leaking, bleeding, crying? Because I went back to like eight weeks postpartum and I was doing all of those things. Oh yeah, I literally was like still wearing a diaper. Like... (laughs) (laughs) Like I was still fully bleeding. I was still going through the entire thing. If it was not for my glam team, I would have never made it there. I hadn't slept in even like months before I got pregnant. So like, I literally, I don't even know. Honestly, I probably just didn't engage in any drama because I was too tired. (laughs) Oh my God. I was co-sleeping. You're co-sleeping with your baby? Wait, you didn't have a night nurse? No, no. So this was a a big thing too that I thought was very funny because people attacked me online because they didn't really understand my sense of humor and I was being a sarcastic bitch. That's somebody that said I should get a night nurse. Why doesn't, you know, your partner pay for it, whatever. And my response is always like, well, why don't you pay for it? Here's my Venmo. Because it's just, 
I'm just like that. So I wasn't, and it turned into this whole, you know, she doesn't have a night nurse, whatever. I didn't want a night nurse. I knew I was going back to work. I knew I was going to spend a minimum of six to 10 hours away from my child that I just had. And that was not my original plan. I was not, I was supposed to take the year off. I was not supposed to be working. And I loved him and I wanted to sleep with him and I wanted to be with him. And when you're breastfeeding every two hours, hour, like I don't want to necessarily get up and go and sit up and breastfeed. Like it's so much easier to just co sleep with him and snuggle. So yes. I was up all night and then I would work all day and then I would do it again. And we did it for 10 months straight. That is it was unreal. Rough. Were there shots when you watched the edit back? Because they they (laughs) love like a low angle of you walking towards the camera in a miniskirt. Were were there shots where you were like, yo, are my mesh panties going to show? Honestly, I didn't care. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I don't care. Let's just get it done. What do you guys want? I'll walk it. Tell me where. I don't care. And that is the beauty, by the way. I felt the same thing going back to work after birthing twins. I went back to a daytime talk show and... Everything that I had cared about the season prior, I just had to let go of because it's like, you yeah. don't have time to think about it. No, no you don't. I, the time, yeah. the energy, none of it. <laughs> none of it. I do oh. still have regrets about going back to work that soon after my twins were born. I just yeah. felt like I wasn't physically or emotionally ready to like keep it all together. 100%. How did how did you you were you like pumping at your metal desk? Were you crying in your Lamborghini oh, yeah. on the way to showings? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I literally would pump while I'm getting glam. I would pump in the car when, I, when I'm when i on my way. I would film yes. and I would have to literally set a timer and be like, if it goes off, I don't give a fuck what we're doing in this scene. I'm walking out of here. And I literally oh would God. leave and I would go pump. And then I would come back and then I would finish and then I would pump on my way home and then I would be with my baby for the night. And it was awful. You got your little lunchbox with your, with your milk and you're yes. trying to find a fridge and yes. you're trying to wash everything. And like yes. you're at work with a whole crew of men that are like, what is happening? And there was plenty of times where I leak through my shirt and the girls would be like, you're leaking. And I would literally just be like, okay, let's just keep going. <laughs> just cover it up with a fistful of hair. <laughs> I've never heard anything more hashtag relatable. Exactly. In your first appearance, the first time we lay eyes on you in the Selling Sunset trailer, you say, quote, I mean business. I'm about my business. I'm here to fuck this shit up. So tell me, do you feel like you fucked this shit up this season? Well, I definitely fucked up some shit and pissed off some people. (laughs) Um, I think for me, it's like when I say that and the way that I say it is that I have a way of ruffling people's feathers without having any intention of doing so. Mm. And when I do have the intention, it, it is very intentional and you are very aware. But I think that it's, I'm so used to that response. And so I just run with it at this point. I know what it is. And so you mean the response that like Chelsea had on Selling Sunset or people in the public have had to your uh, unique arrangement with Nick Cannon, your partner and your baby together, like that criticism and judgment doesn't bother you? Life is too short. I'm going to live how I want, say what I want, do what I want, because I why else would I live any other way? And when it comes to working, like I can't step away from the bag. I can't step away from making money because it's just who I am. So I was like, okay. Um, so anyways, I'm just here to piss you all off. And that's basically what we came to. <laughs> Please wait. What did you but, just say? I can't mess up the bag. Yeah. I can't mess up the bag. That's like, a, I can't like, quote to live by. Yeah. I just can't. I mean, at the end of the day, like I will, if I don't sleep and I get two hours of sleep, then that's what it is. But like, I can't, I just can't mess up the bag. For me, it's not just about the money. It's about financially being free to have time with my child. Because if you don't have the income and you don't have the money, you don't have the time because you have to take your ass to work. And I don't oh want gosh. to. <laughs> yeah, but by the so, way, I think that's a, a, an assumption people have about you that's not true. And I'm glad that you're saying that yeah. because people might think that you're bankrolled by your partner, yeah. but you... Yeah, and it's like, obviously, I need something. Obviously, I need something. I'm good. I made that very clear on that. You know, people take things how they want to take them, but I... For me personally, ever since I I was a kid, it was very important that I had my own stuff. It's just 
my personality, I'm very independent. I'm very like, this is mine. Like I did this. I don't want it to ever be something somebody could take from you. Cause at the end of the day, even women that get married and build companies with their husbands and all of those things, like it's theirs, it's not yours. And I want, I want what's mine. And that is why I think that you are really inspiring as a mom to watch on this show because you're doing you. And I don't care. I mean, I got how? so much shit from people about going back to work, leaving my kids. How could you? But yeah. like, I want to be a strong, powerful woman in the eyes of my kids. I want to be doing what yeah. I love. And I see that in you in every scene on that show. I see that in you. Thank so you. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's something where people, they feel like because you outwardly say who you are, how you are, why things work for you, that you're like forcing it on them. And it's like, it's not that way. I'm very, I I love that some women want to be stay at home moms and raise their kids. And that's what they do all day. And they take that as a full-time job. Seriously. It is so commendable. I respect it so much. I love that. I just, it, it's just not me, but I do spend is literally majority of my time with my child. And I have the luxury to work from home and work when I want to, because I Mm. created that life for myself. So I really do get the best of both worlds, but either way, like it's whatever makes you happy as a person. Like you don't have to fit that cookie cutter box. And like, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) it's true. It is whatever works for you. That's absolutely it. So you're doing what works for you on the show. Did you expect to to come out of it so loved? Like your people love you. I no, I didn't. I was like, (laughs) oh, they're going to rip my ass up. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. It's like, it's unfortunate that my personal situation um, is so controversial to so many people and that they can't see past that. And so I, I really was not sure that this show was going to make it any better or if it was going to make it worse. And I do think that seeing the response that it made it, it did make it a little bit better in the sense of like, people really have like context. They know my personality. They see who I am. Like, it does help. Um, but it's still crazy because I, I definitely, and of course you still get hate, but I didn't realize that I would get like that positive response. I thought I'd get like, yeah, okay, you're all right. I guess, but <laughs> no, it's yeah. overwhelmingly positive. It, yeah, uh, yeah, it was. I'm very thankful and very appreciative because like, this is just who I am. So you're always mm-hmm. going to get what you see. <laughs> I love that. You mentioned before, like you never saw yourself not putting work first. So I am curious, what was your personal journey to motherhood? It was a struggle because I always knew I wanted, at first I thought I wanted five kids. Now, no. <laughs> let me tell you, let me uh, tell you, you don't even want three. Ooh, okay. Girl, I see now everybody stops. So like, they're like no. two, three, this is, this is a good soccer court. No, yeah. Um, no, Brie, if you ever get to a place where you're thinking of going for a third, please phone me. Okay. Let, okay. Got it. I'll I will. be your I will. phone a friend. Okay. I'll talk to you okay. off the ledge. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, I, I think I always struggled because I knew that I wanted to be a mom, but I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. And I want to get more secure in my career. And I sounded like a man that doesn't want to get married and settle down. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we had tried for a couple of years without trying type of thing. Um, and then I think when I hit my 30th birthday, I was like, okay, it's, I, I want them now. It's now or never. Wow. And I literally got pregnant, like, I had, I had two miscarriages and I got pregnant and then it was literally, I had him a month after I turned 31. So it was like in my, in my scope of like my plan and like my vision board that year and stuff. And I was like, I was in a really good place and I had really healed from my divorce and I had gone back and forth uh, with my partner for so many years and we just had such a beautiful relationship and it all just like worked out perfectly. But I wouldn't say I necessarily like, planned it but i had said like oh yeah 30 30 is gonna be good and then when 30. i hit 30 i was like yeah 30 and then it oh just happened <laughs> i love that you yeah. think that thir- having a baby at 31 is like on the older spectrum that's young to to a lot of people i had my twins at 34 and it was a geriatric pregnancy and every appointment i went to they were like so you're a geriatric pregnancy and i was like i'm 34. <laughs> it's like, like it's, it's, that the is, pressure is real. 
They need to change that word. That is so I rude. Know. Geriatric so rude. as if you're like 105. <laughs> Thank you, Brie. So rude. Yeah. So rude. Can we talk about legendary love? First of all, it's an iconic name. Who came up with legendary? So I came up with legend. I didn't like anything. Like I mm. was like, he name. I don't I don't even know what to name him. And then uh, my partner had to put some swag on it. It couldn't just be legend. <laughs> so it had to be like, oh no, I know a legend. And I was like, okay, Wait, well, that's like every legend name. Legend <laughs> was too basic. It, yes. <laughs> it needed yes. more swag. Okay. Yes. And then I said, okay, sure. And when he said legendary, I was like, okay, I kind of like that. Like, that's different. I'm like, I've definitely never met a legendary. Um, so, and I ended up loving it. And I think that I had all these like signs. I started seeing all this, like we would go somewhere and we would see the name legendary something. And then we would, and I was like, okay, that's it. So wow, it was really cute. And you also call him Leggy, right? Yeah. Found Leggy. So cute. And Lilo's another one about Leggy at least stuck. Yeah. Wait, Lilo? As in like Lindsay Lohan's nickname, Lilo? No, like Lilo and Stitch. Okay, okay, fair. Yeah, yeah, erase, yeah. erase the Lindsay yeah, Lohan I was like, Association. Hey, that one yeah, to, from your memory, pretend I never <laughs> yeah, said that. that one <laughs> I was like, and cute. and and Lilo, your Lilo. He also has his own Instagram page with twenty thousand followers. He has like brand partnerships. Why did you choose to share him with the world? Honestly, I think that it's something that's inevitable. There, it was not something that I was going to really be able to keep him from. That's just not logical. As I said, like I did with my relationship, I just wanted to embrace it. I kind of just had to take my emotions out of it and look at it and be like, yes, he's a baby, but there's also an opportunity here. Any brand deals, anything that we do, we're, or this is our life. This is This is our business. This is what comes with it. So why would I not get my son a check that goes into his trust that he gets when he turns 18. I mean, he's already here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he mm-hmm. didn't he didn't have a say in who he was birthed by. If, you know, he might as well get the check if he can. I just <laughs> Why not? Oh my God. I love that so much about you, how open and honest you are when it comes to your life. And so I want to end this conversation with a uh, a little game because you have posted a video in the past called Raw and Honest Vlog. So I want to ask you rapid fire questions that require raw and honest answers in a game called Raw and Honest Rapid Fire. <laughs> raw and Honest Rapid Fire. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, pull up that negligee. Here we go. Okay. What is the hardest thing about motherhood? Everything. (laughs) Specific. Very specific. Sorry. Sorry. Sleep training. Sleep training. Sleep training. Okay, yeah. Oh, my God. Um, You seem so tough on selling Sunset. When is the last time you cried? Um, Probably like two days ago. Oh, do you remember why? Um, I was just overwhelmed with my entire life and a and a birthday party, and I'm closing a deal right now, and just everything. I was like, and I stopped. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. Do you think yeah. you would ever get married again under any circumstances? Nope. That's a hard no. Oh, no for me. No, thank you. A rapid answer. Okay. Yep. Have you ever sold a house you thought was ugly? Yes. <laughs> Did Saweetie buy that house? Actually, funny you're saying that. We put in an offer yesterday on the house. Hey! Yeah. I love that. Congratulations. Hence the crying. You had deals with Sweetie. You had a birthday party to plan. Oh, my God. I've talked to two cast members on this podcast who have beef with Chriselle. Where do you stand with Chriselle? I love Chriselle. Love that. Yeah. Love. What is one question you hate being asked? Are you single? Oh, got it. Okay, because you're not in an exclusive relationship with Nick Cannon, but he is involved in your child's life. You do consider him your partner. So I get it. It's not an easy answer. Yeah. And I'm sure people ask you all the time. Men, women, interviews, life. Yeah. Yes. You have been open about your plastic surgery on Selling Sunset. You even documented a boob job online. Can you list the things that you have had done? Okay. So I've had rhinos, I've had my nose done, I've had my boobs done twice, 
only because, you know, your implants expire after 10 years, but they used to, now they don't. And then I've had filler, I've had Botox, I've had a million lasers, like any kind of like cellulite treatment. Like I will try and do just about anything. I love it all. Have you ever regretted a procedure? Oh, cool sculpt. I regretted cool sculpt. What cool sculpt. is cool sculpt? For the love of God, please, anyone and everyone don't ever do cool sculpt. So as a part of like being, you know, an influencer, being on social media, whatever, you get offered all of these treatments for free, which is a, was the big reason why I do all of these treatments. It's not just because I'm that vain. I mean, oh, I am, but I'm not that vain. Uh, Bri, I've been on social media for 10 years. No one's ever offered me a treatment. Go on. Yeah, they hit you up and say like, hey, we have this new machine. We have this, we have that. We'd love to bring you in to do Botox. We'd love to bring you in to do whatever. So that was a big reason why I started doing all of these things because I was offered for free. Please. Cool Sculpt gave me a full fupa fat pouch. <gasps> Wait, what? Yeah. It yeah. gave you fat? Yes. Oh, it was just, it was so awful. Okay. Cool Sculpt is a no. And if anybody asks me about my fupa, I'll just say it was Cool Sculpt gone wrong. That's why That's I can't exactly. fit these pants. Yeah. Cool yeah. Sculpt. Exactly. Okay, fair. And we've really derailed our rapid fire with a full. But okay, we're back on That's track. Last question. <laughs> Do you listen to Mariah Carey? Sure, it's Mariah Carey. Um, Bree, <laughs> that is how you play Raw and Honest Rapid Fire. Raw and Honest Rapid Fire. Find Bree on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, at <laughs> Bree TS. You can also follow Legendary Love Cannon. Can I shout that out? Because yes. it's yes, adorable. Please. You're yeah. back for season seven. Huh? Um, we're all going to be watching. Please send my love to Legendary Love. And now we just have to hang up and say bye. I will. Bye. Thank mm. you. Bye. I'm sorry you have to go back and see your kids again. I'm, I've just <laughs> I been know. dragging the interview out so I don't have to go be with them. But I'll say I'll, I'll begrudgingly say goodbye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. OK, bye. Thank you. Free TSE who does listen to Mariah Carey and given their connection and their children's blood relation, I think that's a big revelation. Thank you, Brie. And now I have to go to a break so I can have a minute to cancel my cool sculpting appointment. Touched a bullet there. When we come back, you're making requests for jingles from my personal boy band singer. He may fulfill them. But first, he has to throw to this commercial break. Commercial break. We are back and, oh, sorry, hang on. Uh, I got to check my voicemail. Check, check, check your voicemail. Hi, Jesse. This is Jennifer from Hamilton, Ontario. I know you're a Toronto girl, um, so you might pretend you don't know Hamilton, but I know you do. I'm just calling because I was listening to your latest podcast, the Amanda Walsh one, where you also talk about the girl who was shot while she was wearing skims. At the end of that segment, you say, we wish her well, and I feel like I've heard you say this many times before on your podcast. When I heard it this particular time, I was really waiting for the boy band tune of, like, we wish her well, and so I'm wondering if you and Jason would consider creating a new one um, for we wish her well, because I feel like it would get great use on your podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and have an awesome day. Bye. Hi, Jennifer from Hamilton. First of all, I would never pretend I don't know Hamilton, okay? The Hammer is home to phone a friend Max Kerman of the Arkells. It is the waterfall capital of the world. It is the only affordable place to live near Toronto, and it is the industrial backbone of Ontario. In fact, according to a study that came out last week, breathing the air in Hamilton is equivalent to smoking a cigarette a day. And as we've established on previous episodes of this podcast, smoking is back. So living in Hamilton has never been hotter. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer from Hamilton. Yes, I do often say I wish you well on this podcast. I'll tell you why. I say it because it is a direct quote from Gwyneth Paltrow to the victim of her skiing accident. So after defeating him, humiliating him, and winning her court case, she exits the courtroom in a $7,000 Gucci top, leans over to him, and whispers, I wish you well. 
And please know that whenever I say that on this podcast, I am quoting the great GP, another poet, Drake and Gwyneth Baltrow. I'm telling you, there is depth. There are layers to phone a friend. Every episode is like a Taylor Swift song filled with pop culture breadcrumbs. But not in this case because Gwyneth isn't close friends with Taylor Swift and she doesn't eat carbs. But you get it, you know? You know what I'm saying. As for making a signature boy band tune that says, I wish you well, frankly, uh, Jason, we were not asking for her producerial input, were we? The suggestion box is always open. But yes, the suggestion box is always open. And honestly, (laughs) this is a fantastic idea. I do think we would use it on this show. We wish a lot of people well. And please, place any and all requests you would like in voicemail form. So without further ado, please enjoy this brand new bespoke jingle just for you, Jennifer and Hamilton. I wish you well. Oh, I wish you well, baby. Yeah. I'm wishing that I'm wishing you well, baby. I'm, I'm wishing you well. Yes. Thank you to my own personal boy band, Jay Malinowski, for making all of our boy band jingle dreams come true. Thank you for your voicemail, Jennifer and Hamilton. Say hi to the steel workers out there for me. <laughs> and that's our episode. Uh, oh, God. Can you believe we go from a Nick Cannon baby mama cast member of Selling Sunset to discussing the air quality in Hamilton in mere minutes, Jason? <laughs> like that. Well-rounded. The twist and turns well rounded we end every episode with a song Uh, here's the options i feel we have for this week we could do something from the barbie soundtrack v hot right now or we could go matchbox 20s push oh what's your gut instinct what's my gut you know my gut my gut is the same as the gut of a a man in his (laughs) mid-40s q push i wanna push you around Huge thank you to Brie Tiesi, who has never heard this song. Guarantee you she has no idea who this band is. Thank you, Jason, my producer. Thank you for my scandal merch. Thank you for being a friend. Of course, you're welcome. And thanks to our phone of friends. I I could not do this without you. I am off to Gay Montreal to do this show live at the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. You can still grab tickets at the link in the description of this episode. We'll have that very special live episode for you next week. And can we say this? Our guest is a comedy legend who is going to be hilarious. I mean, I I I can't wait for you to hear it. Jason, you won't be with me in Montreal. But you'll be with me in spirit because you better believe I am wearing this. I'm a mother shirt on the plane. <laughs> this is my plane shirt. Okay. Oh, I'm wearing it tomorrow. I'm not taking it off. I do have to go pack six pairs of two small skins, though. So have a great weekend, everybody. I'll talk to you live next week. Bye. Sing it, Rob. Well, I won't do anything at all. I want to push you around. The friend was created by our mom, Jesse Crookson. The executive producers are Jesse Crookson and Jason Yanba. The technical producer is Rob Perra. The amazing theme song and sexy interludes are by Jay Melanowski from Badwin Sound Clash. Phone a friend is part of the ACAST Creator Network. Credits are by us, Ray Gatika and Real Gatika. We're her kids. That's crazy, right? Wow, you're still listening? Okay, see you next week. Bye.